Does it? All right. Uh, today is November 14th of 2018, and I am interviewing Stephen Beasley here at the Illinois State Library. And may I call you Stephen? That's fine. Okay. Uh, Stephen is um, 70 years old, having been born on August 12th of 1948. And so for the recording, would you please state what in what war um, and what branch of service that you served? I was drafted into the Army in 1970 and served in the 101st Airborne Division in Vietnam okay. for one year. All right, could you please tell us uh, a little about yourself, where you were born, and maybe your parents and their occupations? Sure, my, uh, I grew up, I was born in Carlinville, uh, across the street from the big courthouse that we have. It's a, a, a monument to, uh, to Illinois, and uh, it's a, an interesting town. It's a nice city. We have a college there. It's a nice town to grow up in. My friends, uh, a lot of them, uh, who I went to high school with, their folks taught at the college, so it lent a certain uh, air of um, of educational uh, strength to the community and to the high school. It still does. Um, Carlinville is my home. It, I I live there presently. Um, I went to college at Blackburn College. Uh, there, my. Excuse me, you asked me to tell you also about my folks. My mother uh, was forced out of school to help my grandfather run the farm when her four brothers were inducted into the service during World War II. So my mother had to quit school in the eighth grade in order to stay home and drive the tractor or the horses or whatever over by Raymond, Illinois, which is 20 miles away. And my father then um, was, actually he was a, a welder and a blacksmith before he was inducted into the military during World War II and served in England repairing aircraft uh, and ran a welding shop over there and where he learned to work on exotic metals and when he came back home after the war from from four years in England he and my uncle who were blacksmiths my grandfather and Beasley was Harry Beasley was a blacksmith in Carlinville uh, they, they opened a welding shop and they did more exotic metals, but my grand, my uncle, excuse me, my uncle Stephen, who I was named after, um, he was basically the old time blacksmith and ran a forge and did things that, that my father preferred not to do. He wanted to do the more working with aluminum and stainless and things that were uh, more sophisticated that he did in the military. My father was uh, very much of a patriot and served on the uh, the draft board in Macoupin County. Because of that, I was registered in Shelbyville County and then was then assigned a, a deferment number or a 1A a number uh, by that county, which was then referred back to our county. And when they had the, the quota to fill, then they took took me as one of their, their draftees. But I could not be in, their, in our Macoupin County board because of my father's um, a relationship there. Um, this was back during uh, the 60s, and I went to college in Carlinville, Blackburn College. And I was a biology major. I was going to be a veterinarian, and then I started looking around and thinking about mm, there's a lot of things I could do in, in addition to maybe or in, in 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 something different than being a veterinarian. I think half the kids in high school decide they want to be veterinarians. And, and so I looked around and discovered uh, physical therapy through doing a vocational interest test in, um, in college. And I started looking at that as a possible vocation, and yet uh, there wasn't a deferrable uh, job description. They're going to that, to that particular college was not deferrable. So in 1970 then, after I got my bachelor's degree in biology, uh, I knew they had had the lottery by that time, and I think my number was 158. And I knew that I was going to be drafted sometime that summer when the lottery numbers went up to a certain point. And so I worked that summer and kind of um, treaded some water for a bit while I was waiting for that to happen. Um, the times were very stressful at that time. I remember having a real 
difficult time trying to explain to my father how the Vietnam War was different than previous wars. And yet he, uh, he couldn't hear that. And I could only hear it from the people I was in college with at Blackburn, even though it wasn't uh, a large university, there was a lot of people there uh, who were looking at, at what was actually going on. And this was 1970. The war had been going on for quite a long time by that time. In, in 1970, about half the people in the United States and the other half were in favor of the war. And the other half of the people in the United States were opposed to it and said that we should get out or we should have gotten out. And people, some of the great, greatest leaders in our country, um, politicians and, and members of the, of the church, churches, were wholly opposed to us being in Vietnam. It did not seem to be a just war. And yet with my father's relationship and my, I wanted, I was the oldest of five kids in the family and out of respect to my father and I guess uh, I feel of allegiance to the United States, to the country, not the, not the government, but to the country, uh, I, I decided to allow myself to go ahead and be drafted. And so on August the 4th, uh, uh, I got my bachelor's degree in, in uh, May. In August the 4th, then I was drafted into the Army in, in St. Louis and then was sent immediately down to Fort Leonard Wood for basic training with about five or six other guys from, from my hometown. And we all hung together a little bit while we went through basic training. And then uh, it was, all of us had bachelor's degrees. One guy had a master's degree in business, an MBA. And we were all expecting that we would get pretty good jobs, pretty good job descriptions when we got finished with basic training. And as it turned out, when we all got our orders for advanced advanced training, AIT it's called, we all got orders to go to Fort Ord, California for infantry training, to go to Vietnam. Now you got to remember in 1970, half the people were opposed to the war, half the people were in favor of it, and all the guys who, were, who had been in college were lumped together as being opposed to the war. And so they thought, I think that they believe that the best thing they could do was to put us in the infantry to give us a taste for what it would be like to be in the bush, to be sleeping in the mud, to have people shooting at you, and to have to shoot at people. And that violated some of our, uh, our beliefs at the time. Uh, there weren't very many of us who thought that we wanted to, uh, quote, kill a commie for Christ, which was an issue back in those days. They seemed to think that communism was the arch enemy of, of Christianity and that uh, according to Joseph McCarthy, uh, communists were hiding behind every house and every tree waiting to jump on you. And the, the, the fear of communists, I mean, in, in churches we used to pray for the conversion of, of Russia. And my wife remembers that very clearly. Um, she was a Catholic raised in Chicago. Anyway, uh, so we all ended up in the infantry. We all ended up in Fort Ord and we thought, this can't be real. This is a dream. We're going to wake up from this dream and I'm going to be going to school where I'm going to become a vet's assistant or actually I tried to take a direct commission into the medical service corps which my cousin had told me that's what I should do with a bachelor's degree in biology. I should take, I should apply for and take a direct a commission into the medical service corps. And when I went before, this is a jumping way forward now, when I went before the E5 promotion board at the end of my uh, uh, service time. The major who was in charge of the E5 promotion board said, well, why didn't you take a direct commission in the Medical Service Corps? And I paused and said, well, it's because the E2, the enlisted man, who was writing all the paperwork down of the things that I could do or I could do when I was being processed through in the, being admitted into the military, said, well, you can't do that. Of course, that's where... <laughs> Too little knowledge uh, sometimes makes you uh, come up with um, wrong answers. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, I, I wish that I had been able to do that. However, as it turned out, uh, my infantry training was actually more survival training. They said when we got to Fort Ord, you, you, we don't necessarily care what you think about being here in the infantry. 
We're going to teach you things that will may enable you to survive when you, when you go to Vietnam. First of all, all of you are going to go to Vietnam. That's why we're training you in the infantry. And that didn't sound like a very good idea. But they said, we will teach you the things that you need to do to survive. We will teach you how to fire certain kinds of weapons. We will teach you how to, how to respond under, under duress. We will teach you how to find food and to find whatever it is you need to eat, whatever you can eat. And we'll teach you, well, they didn't say brainwash, but we're going to try to indoctrinate you into becoming a member of the U.S. Army which meant running down the road for a couple of miles singing, I want to be an airborne ranger. I want to live a life of danger. I want to go to Vietnam. I want to kill a commie Kong. And those kinds of uh, songs that we sang as we ran down the road were not things we wanted to sing. They were not things we wanted to, to say. But as a group of people, and you're, you're supporting each other. You're not supporting the sergeants who are there with you. You're not supporting the mission of the army. You're not supporting the president of the United States. You're supporting your platoon. That's all you're doing, or your squad. You're supporting the guys in your squad. So that's why you pay attention. That's why you don't do something that causes them to have to do 50 push-ups with you, because that really makes them angry. If they're doing push-ups because you screwed up. And I saw that. I saw guys do that. And and sometimes that just invited a lot more pain for them and also for us, for the rest of us. So after we finished our, I can't remember, it was 10 or 11 weeks of training in Fort, Fort Ord, California, uh, we got our orders for going to Vietnam. Now, I had talked to people who had been to Vietnam and said, well, you're an 11B, that's 11 Bravo, that's an infantry MOS, that's a job description for infantrymen, light weapons infantrymen, which meant that you knew how to fire all these different kinds of, of weapons, not rockets or bazookas or anything. Well, actually, uh, the uh, law, the light anti-tank weapon was like a bazooka. It was a, a, a weapon that just pulled apart and you fired it by squeezing down on this, this um, trigger would supposedly disable a, a very heavily armored uh, piece of equipment, similar to what the RPGs were, what the, the Vietnamese were using against our, our uh, equipment. Um, so I, we learned all these different techniques and things, and we went home for a 30-day leave before we went, and it was a nice time to be able to say goodbye because I, I was pretty sure that with that MOS that I might not be coming home uh, in normal condition. The guys I had talked to in California who had been there, some of them were lifers, some of them were uh, people who were just there for a short time, uh, getting derosing out, getting out of the service. But they were talking about, well, you know, really the only place where there's a lot of activity right now is up on the, the DMZ, up on the demilitarized zone between North and South Vietnam. And so if you don't go up there, you're really not going to have such a bad deal after all. So that was, that was reassuring when we thought about that. And I, I shared that information with my buddies. We all went home and then we all got on the airplane, flew back to Oakland, got on another Flying Tiger Airlines uh, and flew then uh, to Vietnam, Vietnam and landed um, down in Long Binh, which is a, a, a suburb of, uh, of Saigon. We got off this airplane. Uh, it was interesting how they they dove down into the, <laughs> the landing strip. They didn't glide in carefully because it made too much of a target of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So they, they had a kind of a dive down into the airport, which was kind of interesting. I've never done that before or since then. Um, and we had, they opened the door of the aircraft. We walked downstairs down to the tarmac and got onto the, uh, the buses. And the buses didn't have windows in them. The temperature was probably 105 degrees, and the smell, we were right next to uh, a relocation camp, which was where they took the people out of the jungle and out of the rice paddies and, and out of their villages and put them in relocation camps so that it would be easier for us to discern between the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, and um, 
the normal South Vietnamese people. That was the, the idea, I think, of putting them in those camps, keep them separated so that we didn't kill innocent people. Um, I, I don't know how well that worked. I don't think it worked very well. Anyway, we drove by these, these internment camps uh, in the smell of the nukmam, which is uh, fermented fish and rice that these people, these folks would be eating was enough to knock your socks off. I mean, it was something I'd never smelled before. I've smelled rotted fish before, but nothing quite like this. When the other spices added, it was, it was quite an interesting experience, and it was a, a very interesting introduction into, the, into being there for the first night. And then we, we kept in some barracks for that night and got our orders the next morning. And each one of us who were in, from Carlinville, and some of the guys that I'd been in training to at Fort Leonard Wood and then Fort Ord, guys that I'd been hanging around with for now for three months, four months, we all got orders to go to the 101st Airborne Division, which was up on the DMZ. We thought, holy jamoli, this is it, buddy. You bit the poison cookie now. You're going to go up where the last action there is in the, in the country. You're going to go up there and you're going to be you're going to be used for target practice or you're going to have to shoot somebody who you really don't consider to be your enemy. But when you're put in a situation like our sergeants told us in, in California, you can either shoot them or they're going to shoot you, which one do you choose? And so most of us had already decided that we would try to preserve our own lives. Uh, whether we felt like we could or could not kill a, a, an enemy soldier. Killing civilians, we, I, none of us could have done that. Um, the problem with the Viet Cong was that you didn't know, they didn't wear badges that say that we're Viet Cong. The North Vietnamese wore uniforms, but they might not have them on. They, they might not be wearing that, that beige uh, outfit that they showed them wearing in some of the videos. They might look just like another Vietnamese person. And so the, the contact with the 101st Airborne Division with the civilian population was non-existent. We were not supposed to have any contact with any of the Vietnamese people, except when they came in and they worked in our, as KPs in our kitchens. They cleaned our latrines. Um, they worked in like the, the officers club. They would bring in the real pretty girls and, and work in the officers clubs. The uh, NCO clubs, I don't know that we even had any. We, we'd go to the PX and buy alcohol and come back to our barracks, or, or, our hooches, they call them. They weren't really a barracks, they were our hooches. Uh, they were like 32 feet long and 16 feet wide. The CB huts, I think they called them. And uh, made out of plywood and screen on the sides and, and uh, tin roof. And that's where we lived for a year. Uh, I lived right next to the Eagle Bowl, which is where Bob Hope came about four days after I left Vietnam. Bob Hope came, and I got pictures that my friend took of the Eagle Bowl, the Bob Hope show, and there were our hooches were in the background there. I ended up getting to Vietnam uh, early in January of uh, 2001. I spent the whole year of January there. and. No, excuse me, they spent the whole year of, of, of 71 there. I, I think I said the whole year of January. Whole year of 71 in Southeast Asia through December. And when I checked in at the admin company over in Fubai, which I think was actually our address, we were on Camp Eagle, we got posted on Camp Eagle, but the admin company that, that in processed every pencil and every person and every Jeep had to go through the admin company. And when we're in processing, here's six of us there, went through training, uh, infantry training together. This E7 looked at us and said, well, you guys are all college graduates. We said, well, yes, sir, we are. He said, why are you all in the infantry? He said, well, we didn't have much choice. He said, don't any of you know how to type? We said, hell yes, we do. And we all raised our hands. We all knew how to type. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so he gave us a typing test. And of the six of us, I did the best of the six. I did 35 words a minute for three minutes with only 35 errors in a three minute typing test. And that was the best of the six of us. So that wasn't really very good, but a, 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 a clerk trained by the military, I think only had to do 30 words a minute or maybe 40 words a minute with less errors, of course. So anyway, they took me in. They, I was the, the cream of the crop of the typists anyway. They picked me and put me into division headquarters, which was over in Camp Eagle. And, and some of them stayed actually in the admin company in, in Fubai. Some of them uh, became, one of them became the guy with a master's degree in business. He became the division librarian. He drove the library truck around and shared books with people all over the place. And he drove these, this bookmobile up into some of the, the fire bases where he could have easily been killed, but, but he didn't, he, he survived. Anyway, um, we all got jobs in the rear. We're all called RIMFs, R-E-M-F-S, rear echelon mother effers, okay? That's what we were called. And everybody called us that. We called ourselves that. We were glad to be that because the opportunity to instead take our M16s or M60s or M79s or 50 calibers or whatever and go out into the bush or fly off the side of a helicopter was not very, we were all 22 or older. And so, and we'd had time to ponder uh, life. Uh, we weren't 18 year olds. Had I gone over there as an 18 year old, I grew up with guns. I, I probably, I might have been more interested in doing something else, but, but maybe not. I did take typing, typing in high school though, simply because our uh, typing instructor was the most beautiful teacher we had. So all the boys took typing. It saved my life. I thanked her several times when we got back from Vietnam. I thanked her several times for saving my life and my mental health because I knew how fragile the mental health problem could be for people who've done things that they couldn't live with afterwards. So then I was put into the division headquarters into the Judge Advocate General's office, into the front office there with the Sergeant Major, who was a man who was very a dour person, very sourpuss. Uh, and he, an, a warrant officer who ran the office, about 12 uh, lieutenants and captains who were draftees like myself, who were lieutenants of the of, of infantry, or they were lieutenants of, of artillery or whatever. But since they had their, their degree in law, they pulled them from the admin company and put them directly into the Judge Advocate General's office, mm -hmm. Staff Judge Advocate SJA or JAG office there in, in Camp Eagle. And so we did all the legal stuff for the whole division as an enlisted, P, I was a, an E2 at the time, um, E1 when I was drafted, E2 was a promotion, E3 if you, if you didn't make any big mistakes, and, and up the board, I, I, I gradually, eventually became an E5. So being a, a, an E2, then I had the for, good fortune of pulling KP in the commanding general's mess, which he would not allow Vietnamese to work in his mess hall because they were afraid that they could be poisoned. Mm -hmm. So they had stat, they had um, draftees like myself or enlisted people like myself um, pulling KP for them. In the enlisted men's, uh, in their kitchens, they had uh, Vietnamese people that did the KP duty then, uh, usually. I also had the opportunity to pull bunker guard one or two nights a week I also, the, the East, the, the Sergeant Major I was telling you about, who was in, in charge of our office there uh, briefly, sent me down to get my, my driver's, my military driver's license. So I read the book, I went down, took the test, and came back, and I, I showed it to him, and he said, how did you do that? I said, well, I read the book that you gave me, I went down, took the test, and here I am. He said, you passed it the first time? I said, well, yeah, it was just a driver's test. Well, he could hardly believe it. So he checked his records, and by gosh, sure enough, I had I had won, I, I had gotten my driver's uh, license, so I could drive uh, three-quarter ton trucks, Jeeps, Deuce and a half, which is the biggest truck that I would be driving. I did that quite a bit on bunker guard. So I would drive the officers around, 
to to Fubai to from Camp Eagle to Fubai was it was five miles or so. For them to take a deposition and something like that and come back or go to the PX or whatever I had to do, I was whatever the whatever they wanted me to do. I cleaned the offices. I typed 10, 12 hours a day. I didn't care. Um, I, I did anything I was asked to do. And by having an MOS, a job description of light weapons infantrymen, they could always say, well, if you don't want to do this, we'll have you go out to the bush. You know, we have these guys out there up, uh, up on the DMZ who are not having a particularly good time. We'll send you up there. So they had that threat over us all the time. And so we always worked extra hard to try to preserve what we had, our, our, our faculties and our, our lives. Uh, probably halfway through that, I, I got to meet a lot of different people. I got to meet a lot of, uh, of uh, lawyers from all across the country. Uh, I got to meet some really nice uh, lawyers who were uh, the colonels and the majors who, who ran our Judge Advocate General's office. Uh, some of them were schnooks, but uh, some of them were pretty nice guys. Um, and I got to meet a guy who worked in the public information office, which was two hooches down. We call these buildings hooches because they were just all just little shacks that uh, strong wind, in, in fact, in the, during the... Uh, the monsoon season in November, I think some of them blew down. They were so flimsy. The roofs blow off of them. The wind was, uh, there was, monsoon was like going through a hurricane, except that it's in, in Southeast Asia. Um, I got to know this guy from the public information office, two doors down from us. And he and I sat and ate together a couple of times. And I think he was an E5, and I was an E3 or an E4 by that time. And he said, uh, you have your driver's license? I said, yeah. He said, can you get a Jeep? I said, I might try to. Can I, maybe I can borrow one from the colonel if you let me borrow it. He said, how about if we drive into the city of Way and we'll teach English to the citizens there, to the civilians there. In the Cook High School, which was, I think it was a Catholic high school where supposedly Ho Chi Minh attended high school, where he went to school there. I thought, well, this is a rare opportunity to do something constructive in the midst of all this chaos and destruction. Maybe I could do something positive for this time that I'm spending here. And so it turned out that uh, sometimes twice a week we would drive in after our chores were all done at the end of the day. Before dark, we would drive in. You didn't want to be out after dark because it wouldn't take anybody to, to really snuff out a, a Jeep. So we go in and go to the Cookock High School, where they were heavily guarded by the Arvins, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And we would meet with uh, adults and high school kids, anybody who wanted to learn to speak English. We did the audio lingual type, where we would speak to them, and they would repeat to us. They knew some of the words, like they had memorized vocabulary, but they didn't know how to speak English. And that was a wonderful experience. I met two young women who actually became boat people. We were going to come to Illinois the year after I got back, and they wanted to go to the University of Illinois, and their father had enough money in his business in the city of Way that hadn't been completely destroyed yet uh, to send them to, to the United States to go to college. And I was going to sponsor them to, to come. As it turned out, when I left at the end of 71, by the middle of 72, the 101st had stood down, was standing down, and North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, Viet Cong came back and took over the city of Way. And she and her family moved south and became boat people and ended up in Thailand, virtually dead from starvation. Um, I did run into one of them in Philadelphia. I, I sent out in the Vietnamese newspaper back in the United States, I sent out an, an, a, 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 an advertisement looking for this young woman. Um, Nguyen Thi Lan An was her name, and uh, found out she was living in Philadelphia with some of her family, you know, a large, you know, spread out family, cousins and whoever. I, I don't think her sister made it uh, out of the out of Thailand. I don't know if she died or not. Anyway, that was one of the best experiences I had. Uh, it was then it, because it would be dark by that time. 
Then we would go to the MACD compound, was military assistance, Vietnam uh, compound in the middle of the city of Way, where the Arvins were protecting, they were on guard duty all the way around and, and protecting us while we slept uh, you know, for the night. And then got up early the next morning, bring the Jeep back, and then get ready for another day of uh, whatever we had to do uh, back on, on post, back on, uh, th th back on Camp Eagle. Um, the city of Way was what you see in pictures of a, of a city that's been virtually completely destroyed. You see piles of rubble here and piles of rubble over there. And as you slow down in your Jeep, you don't want to go too slowly. Kids come up and they grab your wristwatch and try to pull it off of you because that way they can make some money mm -hmm. selling a wristwatch. Well, if your wrist, wristwatch didn't come off your wrist, they'd almost pull you out of the Jeep. And that happened to me going as we were going slowly because of the traffic situation. I about got pulled out of the Jeep one morning, and uh, but that's that was I, I understood why that kid did that. He was just trying to make a living, just like everybody else was, uh, in the middle of absolute chaos. The worst, uh, the ugly, most ugliness I think I've ever seen, except on television when you look at at war zones that we still managed to create. I, I learned a lot while I was there. I. I, I Got a chance to go on R and R to Hawaii with my met my wife there, which was a really weird thing. I mean, here I am in Vietnam, and then, then the next day I'm in, in Hawaii, and I, I remember sitting down in the shower and going to sleep in the shower. I was so exhausted that um, that anyway, that's that's what they give you. They get they gave you opportunities to do that uh, to meet a family member like in Hawaii, or you could go to Australia. Uh, or to uh, Thailand or uh, Hong Kong or wherever you wanted to go for a, a, a really nice little vacation. It was a wonderful opportunity. And it, it made it less expensive so everybody could afford that. Some people didn't do very well with those. They went home and, and found that um, working in the Judge Advocate General's office, I saw all of the bad things that happened to people. And some of them were people that went to Hawaii and met their wives who had run off with John Smith and, and found somebody else that they that they were wanted to live with. And so some of these guys came back to Vietnam and did heinous things and uh, were prosecuted for it. Um, we We made the best of, what, of the circumstances we had. Uh, I remember reading in the newspaper, though, and Richard Nixon was speaking, and, and President declares we're not in uh, in Laos in Cambodia. On the top of the page and the headlines of the, of the um, Stars and Stripes, and the guys I was uh, I was working with, the guys I was uh, elbowing elbow to elbow with. We're flying in and out of Laos and Cambodia every day, mission after mission after mission. And yet that was just one element of the lies that we were told. And I understood that oftentimes lies are told like that, but that was the whole issue with, with Vietnam. Is What is the justification for us being there? And as it turns out later, I, I think that the whole justification for us being there was not stopping the domino effect of, of communism. It was not stopping this wall of communism marching toward us. It was making billions of dollars for investors in our military industrial businesses in our country. Helicopters, man, they shot down helicopters like they were like they were Yugos. I mean, they were just you know, a several million dollar helicopter was taken out by one lone sniper. I mean, that, it was that easy to do. Those things made big targets. And I don't know how many thousands of those helicopters went down. The arms sales. I recently found out a friend of mine who used to work for the Western in Alton, Illinois, which is down uh, along the Mississippi River. The Western is where they made ammunition for a long time. And he found out that that ammunition was being sold through Canada. It was being sold in North Vietnam. It was being manufactured in our own country. It made him so angry, he cut off all relations. He, he quit work down there. He, he, um, 
refused to even mention their name anymore. Mm -hmm. He had been he had been in Vietnam and has a little business uh, selling tires now. But anyway, that really that offended him. Uh, and yet, when you look at all of the other things, the guns that were sold, the uniforms that were sold, the food that was sold, the aircraft, Flying Tiger Airlines. I mean, they made a fortune hauling people back and forth from Vietnam to the to the we called it we called it coming back to the United States was coming back to the world. How are we doing with time? Good. So anyway, as the, you had a, a short timer's calendar, you had 365 days on this this calendar. It might have been a screaming screaming eagle, which was the 101st Airborne Division. They had 365 little things that you could color in. Or it might have been uh, the finger, just somebody giving the finger to the FTA, fuck the army, is what it meant. Mm -hmm. And that was divided up into 365 little things. And so you never really got away. FTA was written all over everything, okay? Every building, every urinal, every place. People, there were so many <laughs> unhappy soldiers. And I understand that in any war, there's a lot of people that don't want to be there. Okay, but the dispiritable, the dispiriting situation in Vietnam was, we couldn't figure out what what we were doing there, and the guys who were in the on the infantry, they couldn't figure it out either. You know, they would take one hill, they would come back from that hill, and then a week later they'd go back up and take over the same hill again, and they it never made any sense to anybody, not even to the to the colonels and the, the majors and the the officer cadre. Anyway, that was what what you end up doing in the military is you say yes to the uh, higher the higher the chain of command. You have to just say yes, I'll do whatever you want us to do. The problem in Vietnam was it got so bad that fragging actually started happening, uh, not too infrequently. So that somebody would have the pin of a grenade pulled and it would be dropped inside the the commanding officer's hooch. That was called a fragging. Sometimes they would use something a little more sophisticated, like a claymore mine, which would take out everybody in the hooch. Uh, claymore mines were, uh, hmm, they looked like, hmm, I don't know, a slab of bacon, semi-curved, and you, would, you had little prongs that you would set it up in the dirt, and it would kill everything in front of it mm -hmm. for 50 meters or so. And you had a little button you tripped, you tripped it with, a little wire that ran back to where you were li lying in a hole or behind a log or whatever. And somebody coming through the wire or coming through, um, coming toward you at night, first you have to establish who they were, and then you'd hit that if they weren't a friendly. Um, fraggings were, were not something you wanted to think about, but there were people who deserved it, who were not heads, who wouldn't pay attention to what the enlisted men were saying. You can't do it this way because it'll kill us. If you do it the way you're saying, to do it the way they taught you at, at, in school, we're all going to die. So that lieutenant had to learn to listen. If they didn't, they were, they were actually killed by friendly fire, oftentimes, um, and nobody knew that. But. Um, that was a, it was a hard time. Um, Vietnam was a very, very difficult war. If you look at Ken Burns' 10 series, 10 series issue of Vietnam War, he points out all of the lies upon which that war was based from the president on down. And the international policies that were done that were done out of ignorance. I mean, Robert McNamara was asked after, after the war was long done, uh, in the, I don't remember, it's the fog of war or in retrospect. I don't remember which one, but uh, he was asked by the Vietnamese uh, person representative, did you not know the history of the Vietnamese people? He paused and he said, no. He said, you didn't know that we were fighting the Chinese for years and years and years, and we were fighting the, the the Japanese and we were fighting the French and here you guys come in and you don't think we can fight you you know and McNamara said no we don't know we didn't know that now how could somebody who's running the war 
who's got his ear to the, the president's, his, his mouth to the ear of the president, telling him what to do, how to escalate this, and how to win the war, he didn't know their history. He didn't know anything about the Vietnamese people. People still tell me, I, I had a guy last week, I was working in a veterans fair last week, and a guy said, you know, I was in charge of Pershing missiles in, in Germany, and he said, if we'd have brought some of those down to Vietnam, we could have had some nuclear explosions that would have ended that war. I said, well, you know, that would have been the first time that nuclear weapons were used that I know of uh, since since World War II, and that would have then escalated the war into something completely different, and it would have caused problems that you would never could imagine how bad that would have been. With the Chinese watching us and the Russians watching us and everybody else watching us. Because we, we actually had the black eye. We wore the brown helmet, or we were the, I guess you might say, the villains of, of that whole decade of the 60s, early part of the 70s, that whole war. We were the, hmm, uh, what's the word, the imperialists, which they called us. They called us imperialists. Nobody really thought about that, but that's what we were doing. And we were trying to create markets for our goods. We we're trying to control people's minds and parts overseas, and we still continue trying to do it. Today, we've got troops in over 150 countries, and that's something that's, that's wrong. I still believe that. I do believe that. We don't belong there. We don't belong. We should not be telling people that living the way we do is the right way to live. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily true. And you say we live in the best country in the world. We live in the country that's the biggest bullies in the world. Yes, we are. If you don't believe us, we'll give you a bloody nose to, to show you. And we have all the nuclear arms waiting to do it if you, if you don't believe us. But we don't want to do that because you don't make any money if you use nuclear arms. You see, you make money by using restrained forces like we have, land forces. And that's the whole name of the game is making money. Follow the money, you follow what's the, where the power goes, and you'll follow what happens in, in the international political scene. How much... How many billions of dollars of, of arms can we sell to Saudi Arabia? Is it 310 billion or is it 410 billion? Hmm. Well, I, I, I know that's important to know that, but I, I don't really want to know that. And I don't want us to be doing that. But anyway, that's my own philosophy I developed since, since Vietnam War. I came home. I got in the Friedenberg in, in Da Nang right before Christmas. I got an early, an early drop so that you could come home right before Christmas. They were very kind to us. I was supposed to come home like the 12th of January. They let us come home like the 20th of December to be home with family at Christmas time. That was very kind. Mm -hmm. Someone was very thoughtful about that. The guy standing in front of me was another kid from Carlinville. I couldn't believe it. I looked at the back of this guy's head and I must have seen his profile. I said, Malcolm, you're, 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 this got to be Malcolm Allen, and he turned, and it was him. And uh, we talked all the way home. But you know, the, the world's a small place. Um, and I, the the thing about the Vietnam War, I've tried getting together with some of my friends that I was in the military with. None of them were interested. And I don't know. I don't think it was just my personality. I, I don't think I was particularly abrasive. There were times I was real crabby, but. Uh, most of the people don't want to even think about that. They don't want to be reminded of it. They don't want to sit at the VFW and drink and talk about those those good old times, because they, they was, those weren't good old times. Um, so when um, so when you were discharged, then yeah. you had completed your military service. What led to that? And well, I got a six month drop. I got a six month early out. When we came home, they, they were trying to cut back the size of the army by a hundred thousand men quickly. So they said, if you get your 18 months in, that's a year and a half, coming back from Vietnam, instead of having you go to Fort Riley, Kansas, which I was supposed to go, we'll let you out six months early, and you still get your, your veterans' benefits. Mm -hmm. So I went back down to Fort Leonard Wood, and, and after a few weeks then of, of watching guys do KP and clean roof buildings and stuff like that, since I was an E5, I could be a, a supervisor of other enlisted men then. Um, 
they gave me the six month early out and all of my friends got the same thing the, the guys that were all in service with me and that was partly the reason uh, part of the reason that, that was became when we came back from Vietnam nobody wanted to polish their brass or shine their boots anymore mm -hmm. you know we had enough of that when we were in training when we went to Vietnam nobody polished their brass nobody shined their boots unless you were working in division headquarters and sometimes you didn't have a choice but and, and so the guys coming back from Vietnam were particularly uh, disorderly. And so guys going back to the different bases around the country were causing some major problems. And so they let them out. Their military service in Vietnam was done. They said, okay, you're done. You're out of here. We're done with you. They didn't even require us to, to do the time in reserves like they required the other enlisted people mm -hmm. to do. Other, usually there was a four-year enlisted Reserves, not the enlisted reserves, reserves, U.S. Army reserves for those folks um, afterwards. Didn't have to do that. They wanted us, they said, you're done. Goodbye. So we came home. I went to, I, I came home, I got out in February. I was lucky enough to get into an abnormal psych class. My wife was working at the college where we graduated. I was able to get into an abnormal psych class, which then gave me all the credits I needed to get into School of Physical Therapy, which I, I worked until August, the middle of August of that year in my hometown in Carlinville. Then I went to school in Philadelphia. I got um, a degree in physical therapy, and I worked for 40 years from 1973 then through 2013 doing physical therapy, 32 years of which was in hospitals, uh, seven years in private practice or in doing home health and uh, yeah, I, I did home health for 17 years, actually, but mm -hmm. I did, um, I, 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 I was happy to have done that. I felt, I felt like everything I was able to do when I got back was a gift, because I thought, actually, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make it through this, because mm -hmm. of having the Vietnam, uh, not the, the, the 11 Bravo job description in the infantry, and then being sent to, to 101st, I thought, I was ready to write a letter home. In fact, I started writing a letter home and saying that, you know, uh, I'm sure glad to have known you folks, but uh, you probably won't be hearing much from me anymore. And um, I never finished that letter because that's when I got attached then to the headquarters company in, in, on, in Camp Eagle. Um, I, I, I am not sorry that I did that. I've learned so much about the military, I learned so much about politics, I learned so much about people. I mean, you can't help but live every day and learn something about people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I learned about some of the real weird people that are out there. You know, the lifers, we called them lifers, people that are military, uh, people that stay in the military for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, learned a lot about uh, how they do, how they do things and and, and the, the waste the waste is incredible you cannot imagine the amount of waste that's generated by the military you know if you you just in the, the, the war in general i mean if you take this building and, and turn it crumble it into uh, little stones uh, that's what their that's what they do that's their job and to kill everybody inside the building. Well, that's, anyway, that's, um, I'm, I'm glad I had that experience. It's made me more critical, I think. Uh, my friends, a large number of them are Republicans, and I, I can't stand to be around them when they're talking about how great they are. And I can't stand to talk to them when they talk about international policy. Um, I can't stand the, the idea that people can can say it's okay for us to sell $410 billion worth of arms to a country like Saudi Arabia. What are they going to do with that? What do you do with $410 billion worth of arms? Oh, well, we just use it until it's no longer any, any good, and then we recycle it. No, no. You have explosives there. You have nerve gas there. You have... Things that are incredible. People don't even have a clue is what we're talking about. In the, in the in the civilian life, you don't want to know about it. 
People do not want to know what the military does. Uh, and so they let the politicians uh, coordinate all of that. And so you expect that the politicians are going to do a good job of that. And uh, traditionally, they haven't. Anyway. Well, um, I want to thank you for your time, for coming for the interview. I appreciate you coming to Springfield. And thank you for your service. It was a hard time, but thank you for just... Well, you didn't have a choice, but for going and doing your part, and we do appreciate that. I have a question for you. Are you still on being recorded here? Uh, I have a question for you. I was reading in the Vietnam Veterans Against the War newspaper, which is covers the Iraqi and Afghan wars as well, that they were saying that uh, thank you for your service is a patronizing thing to say to somebody, and I've been thinking about that. And when I tell people that, sometimes it really offends them. They think that they're being very nice and saying thank you for your service. You know, and I, 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 like I said before, I'm happy to serve my country. Mm -hmm. But to serve in the Vietnam War, uh, that was a big mistake. That was a whole thing was a big mistake. Happy, thank me for, for participating in that. I feel guilty about that. Mm -hmm. More than anything, I feel like I should have refused somehow. Mm -hmm. Somehow, but I, but I didn't. I was compliant. Mm -hmm. I agreed that I would kill people, kill innocent mm -hmm. people. And that was my job description, was killing people when I went over there. And so that, that, that bothers me. When people tell me that, I, I, it, it, it bothers me. And I've told a couple of people, you know, that's a very patronizing thing to say, and it really irks them if I, if I tell them that. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they're very thoughtful after I said that. Yeah. Well, I can understand that. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Sue, thank you. You're very welcome.